Hello. Uh, welcome to this series of lectures on spectroscopy. Uh, today, I am going to take up the second part of our understanding of rotational spectrum. Uh, in today's session, I will talk to you about uh, the effects of non rigidity of the molecule on the spectrum and also of isotopic substitution uh, in the molecule. And what we are going to do today is, uh, I will quickly recall what we did in the previous session when we talked about rigid rotor and things like that. And then thereafter, uh, we will take up uh, how do we talk about or the account for the intensity of spectral lines what we get in case of a rotational spectrum. Then we will come down to uh, the effect of isotopic substitution, wherein we will see that if I uh, replace one of the atoms of a molecule by its isotope, what happens? What happens to the spectrum? And then how do we make use of that information? Thereafter, uh, we will take up the effect of non-rigidity because, as I've been, uh, as we mentioned in the previous session also, that our molecule is not rigid. Though we started with the rigid motor, rotor as a model system. So, what happens as a consequence of non-rigidity that we shall be taking up that we will see in terms of uh, the energy expression for a molecule which is not a rigid rotor and the corresponding energy level diagram. Then we will see uh, what kind of spectrum do we get here and then towards the end we will try to sum up what we do in today's session. Let us quickly recall what we did in the previous session. Uh, we started with defining what is rotational spectrum and outlined its scope and significance. That means, what all kind of information can we get from rotational spectrum. Thereafter, uh, we considered rigid rotor as a model for a diatomic molecule. And as a consequence of that, we uh, talked about the energy expression for a, such a molecule which is behaving as a rigid rotor and the corresponding energy level diagram we discussed about. And thereafter, uh, we did talk about the prerequisites that means, what is the requirement for a molecule to show the spectrum and then thereafter we took up the selection rules of a rotational spectra. And then we did explain the nature of the spectrum if the molecule happens to behave as a rigid rotor and towards the end we used uh, one of the sample uh, spectra to determine the bond length of a simple molecule like carbon monoxide. Let us proceed. Let us talk about the intensity of spectral lines. You will recall that when we talked about the rotation spectrum of a diatomic molecule, considering the molecule to be a rigid rotor, we found that the, the, this spectrum consists of a series of equally spaced lines and the spacing happens to be equal to 2 b bar, where b bar is a rotational constant. That is, we had a set of lines which are equally spaced there. Now, the question arises what about the intensity of spectral lines? Because you will recall from our earlier episodes uh, when we talked about the introduction to spectroscopy, uh, we talked about that any spectrum has got three characteristics there. What is the position of the line or the signal coming there? What is the intensity or what is the width and so on and so forth. So, in the previous session, we talked about the position that we where are the spectral lines going to come. We did not make any mention about the, uh, the intensity. Now, let us try to raise that question and try to answer that. Now, the question is are the lines of equal intensity or there is a variation in that? If that if there is a variation, what kind of variation is there and why of it? To do that, let us try to recall that as just mentioned that the intensity of a signal depends on three factors the transition probability, the second is the population of the states involved and third is the path length of the sample. Let us take this quickly take them uh, one by one. You remember that the transition probability is a measure of allowedness of a given transition. What it means is that if I got energy levels and if I want to make a transition from a given level to another level, how likelihood is that transition to be? That means, uh, if you remember we talked about that we have to talk about the wave function of the, start, uh, the energy level from where the transition is starting, the wave function of the, this, uh, the, transition, the level at which the transition is going to go and then on the basis we try to compute what is called as a transition dipole moment. If that happens to be 0, we say transition is not allowed. If it happens to be 1, we say it is allowed. So, that is a general way of looking at transition probability. Now, what has been found uh, theoretically for rotational spectrum, the transition probability of all transitions wherein delta j happens to be plus minus 1 is almost equal. That means, all the transitions we mentioned about say from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 
all of them are equally likely that means in other words we can say that the intensity does not depend on the transition probability that means in terms of transition probability all transitions are likely to be of same intensity that means we have to consider the other two consider uh, other two factors which happen to be the population of energy levels and the concentration of the molecules we are taking there concentration of solution or whatever system we are talking about what is the concentration there we'll come to that later on now let's recall one more thing here uh, you remember that what happens is if there's a transition which happens from say any two levels say from level energy level e1 e2 and e3 let that be three energy levels there now suppose i'm talking about two transitions say from energy level e1 to e3 or from e2 to e3 if i have to if everything remains remain the same that means if they have got same transition probability then the transition which originates from a level say in this case happens to be e1 which has got more population if this transition has to be there this will be of higher intensity than the one which originates from e2 because this e2 level will have lower population now in case of rotational transitions what we see is that uh, this is the same picture we have shown seen earlier that means the transitions are from say 0 to 1 1 to 2 and so on and so forth now what we see is that the intensity as we just mentioned is going to be uh, dependent on the population of the levels from which the transition is going to take place that means what is the population of j is equal to 0 level j is equal to 1 j is equal to 2 and so on and so forth how do we compute that how do we compute that is that for rotational energy levels the population depends on two factors the first one happens to be the boltzmann equation which is very familiar to all of us that is general equation which reads as n upper by n lower to be equal to e raised to power or exponential raised to power minus delta e by kt where k happens to be boltzmann constant and delta e happens to be the difference in energy of the two levels i'm talking about and n lower typically suppose i got two energy levels so if i start my transition from here to here if i want to compare the two populations the population of this level is going to be lesser than this one that means the lower levels are always more populated than the higher levels so that is a generalized there's a general outcome of the boltzmann equation we have is that as the energy levels go higher and higher the population goes on decreasing and second factor which matters uh, in the context of the population rotation energy levels is the degeneracy of energy level uh, you will recall we talked about degeneracy uh, when we talked about particle in three dimensional box you remember that that uh, that means degeneracy refers to there are number of energy levels having the same energy okay so what is found is that the degeneracy of rotation energy levels happens to be 2j plus 1 that means twice the rotational quantum number plus 1 that that is the degeneracy now so there are two factors one is boltzmann equation second is degeneracy level to put together so we can say that the population of rotational energy level is going to be proportional to 2j plus 1 uh, that is the degeneracy factor and exponential minus ej by kt so you can see that i'm talking about that energy in terms of the rotational energy levels now we had a general equation earlier now we're talking specifically now what you find is there are two opposing factors the degeneracy factor increases with increasing j so it is just 2j plus 1 as j increases this factor goes on increasing on the other hand as i mentioned earlier that the boltzmann factor decreases exponentially with increasing j as j increases we find that with the negative sign tells us that is the population of the level higher energy levels is going to be going down as the j value increases so there are two opposing factors as a consequence of that what happens is the population first increases that means the degeneracy factor becomes predominant and as j increases uh, the boltzmann factor becomes predominant and as a consequence we find that uh, generally speaking uh, the relative population of rotational energy levels follows this kind of a pattern what it shows is that when j level is low the population is fairly less because this is a combined effect you remember we have one factor the degeneracy second is the boltzmann distribution factor now what happens is as j value increases we find that the relative population of levels goes on increasing and it comes to a maximum and starts decreasing thereafter that means in the first half of it that means before the maxima it is the degeneracy factor which is predominant and in the later part it is a boltzmann distribution or boltzmann factor which becomes significant there now as a consequence of this 
what you have to really uh, take note of is that it passes through a maxima and the level which has maximum population can be shown to be uh, equal j max uh, the j value for which the population going to be maximum can be shown to be equal to k into t 2 h c b bar minus half. So, that is a simple derivation which you can do. Now, what is important is that how does it translate into the spectral intensity let us have a look at the picture here. You, what you find is that there are different energy levels there and the corresponding transitions what you find that if I start from say uh, 0 to 1 level or 1 to 2, 2 to 3 we find that that the signal happens to be very small to begin with then the larger one still larger still larger and comes down it comes to a maximum and starts decreasing. That means, it is a reflection of uh, what we just talked about distribution of the relative population of different energy levels there. There are two things here uh, let me recall for you that is as regards the spacing as regards the position of lines go they happen to be same we are still are having things as equidistant, but what has happened is the lines are not of equal intensity the intensity increases comes to a maximum starts decreasing thereafter. So, that is a kind of spectrum I will be observing. Okay. Let us move further let us move further and see that uh, let us have a look at a small problem to solve here say calculate the most intense line in case of a the spectrum of a carbon monoxide at the temperatures given as 300 K and 300 degree centigrade. So, chosen temperature which are far different from each other and we are given the rotational constant to be 1.91 centimeter inverse it is same as what we computed in the previous episode. Now, what I want to show you by this is that is I have given a formula which is very straightforward and we have these values which are known to us that is the Boltzmann constant, Planck's constant and the velocity of light. I just simply substitute in that and what I find is that J max happen to be 7 at 300 K that means about 27 degree centigrade and happens to be 10 at 300 degree centigrade. What it means is as the temperature increases that the maxima the level having maximum intensity also move to a higher J value. So, that is the significance of this equation we had. Now, let us move further let us move further and try to see that if I have a molecule a diatomic molecule I have a spectr uh, rotational spectrum for that and if I replace one of the atoms of the molecule by one of its isotopes what kind of effect I am going to observe let us understand that. So, we know that that isotopic atoms are chemically identical whether it is a, so you talk about say C 12 or C 13 chemically there is no difference between them the only thing is they differ in terms of their masses. And secondly in a molecule if I replace one atom by its isotope say I replace oxygen 16 by oxygen 17 in carbon monoxide molecule nothing is going to happen to the chemical properties of carbon monoxide that remains the same. The only thing is uh, the mass will change, but the internuclear distance that is the bond length also will remain unaltered it remains the same. As I mentioned the total mass will change and consequently the moment of inertia will change. So, you remember uh, we, we mentioned about moment of inertia to be a very significant factor when you talking about rotational motion here. So, by doing isotopic substitution what I am expecting is I am expecting that the moment of inertia of the molecule will change and as a consequence we are going to expect some kind of a change in the spectrum let us see what happens here. Now, if I do substitution uh, we said that our moment of inertia changes if a moment of inertia changes we know that moment of inertia is related to the rotational constant that means, we had b bar to be equal to h by 8 pi square i c. So, if this i increases or decreases same will happen to the b bar that means, there will be inverse relationship if this increases b bar is going to decrease and so on and so forth. That means, if the isotope is heavier than the atom being replaced then value of i will increase rotational constant will decrease that is typically what is done ok that is fine that is the b bar will alter depending on the, uh, the mass of the isotope being substituted. And if I look at the rotational constant we have just seen that rotational constant is inversely related to the moment of inertia. So, what we see is if I take the ratio of b bar to b bar prime where b bar is the rotational constant of the molecule when it is a normal molecule where a given isotope is there. If I replace that by say another isotope then the b bar gets changed to b bar prime and if I just substitute the value of this b expressions we find that the ratio of these two 
B B bars that means B bar the normal one and the substituted one happens to be inversely related to the corresponding uh, reduced masses. So, let us see uh, in what way does the energy level diagram get altered uh, if I make an isotopic substitution. Now, what I am showing you here is there are two sets of energy level diagrams one for a normal carbon monoxide molecule wherein there is a carbon 12 isotope. Yeah, so in the, if I replace carbon 12 by carbon 13, what I find is the energy level diagram becomes slightly different here. That means, the energies at different levels get altered. And what we observe here is, uh, if I am replacing carbon 12 by carbon 13, essentially I am using a heavier isotope. When I am using a heavier isotope, the reduced mass of the molecule will increase, which in turn will mean that my uh, moment of inertia will increase because that is mu r square, r remaining constant. If I increases, then what happens? My B bar will decrease because B bar is related inversely to I. So, that you can see here that is that is manifested in terms of because our the difference in energy levels happens to be. So, this happens to be 0, 2 B bar, 4, 6 B bar, 12 B bar, 20 B bar and so on and so forth. Now, since B bar has decreased, so what happens is this levels get slightly closer to each other. In terms of spectrum, what you find is say this is the normal spectrum we had here the bold yellow color lines here that is the spectrum for my normal molecule carbon monoxide with carbon atom being C 12. If I replace this by C 13 what happens is the spectra spectral lines shift we find that they get narrower and narrower because now this gap is not uh, same as before. So, this shift will be a consequence of uh, replacing a given atom by its isotope. And this uh, is, is a significant shift here because B bar now will become B bar prime. Then uh, the characteristic will remain the same. And this change in spectrum uh, on isotope solution can be used uh, for the determination of atomic mass of isotopes. I have just taken the same example here. If I replace carbon 12 by carbon 13 in carbon monoxide, we find that the B bar decreases from 1.9211H to 1.836. That means there is a decrease in. Uh, the B bar value. So, for this information can be made use of in terms of uh, this relationship we had earlier, uh, wherein the primes indicate the heavy isotope. So, substituting uh, the values on the spectrum, uh, what we get is that the ratio of B bar to B bar prime is 1.046. Let us equate this to the ratio of our reduced masses and substituting the atomic masses of the isotopes here and equating it to 1.046 the experimental value of the, uh, this ratio, what you find is uh, we get an expression which can be solved for m prime and in the process what we get is dropping mass of carbon 13 to be 13.007. Uh, this is in excellent agreement with the actual value which happens to be 13.00335 that means the error is less than 0 0.02 percent that is fairly good. So, in addition to uh, getting the atomic masses of different isotopes, we can use rotation spectrum even to get the isotopic abundances of different isotopes of a given uh, element. What we do is in such a case, we compare the intensities of the lines. So, that gives you information about the isotopic abundances. Okay. Let us move further. Uh, Let us now talk about non-digit rotator or non-digit rotor. You remember that we have assumed so far that the diatomic molecule happens to be rigid with constant internuclear separation. But uh, the question is, is it really rigid? Because we know that the molecule executes vibrational motion. We all know fairly well the molecule is not at rest ever. It is always vibrating. If it is vibrating, then of course, uh, this bond length does not remain constant. It keeps varying. And also, be besides this, if I go for higher j values, that means you remember that when j bar is equal to 0, the molecule is not rotating at all when j is equal to 1 energy becomes more molecule starts rotating. If I go on increasing j what happens is I am giving more and more energy to the molecule which means the molecule is going to rotate very fast. If it happens in that way what we can expect is uh, that there will be some kind of a distortion there the molecule will try to spread out. Okay. So, uh, what we expect is the molecule will distort as a consequence again the internuclear distance will not remain the same. So, that means, both the cases we find 
that the bond length does not remain constant or in other words we can say that our the so called assumption the molecule happens to be a rigid rotor is not in order. So, we have to bring in the non rigidity when we do that by considering that a non rigid rotor undergoes some kind of a centrifugal distortion that means, if I am rotating molecule very fast it will try to go away from the uh, center of the mass. Okay. So, that means, it is spread out from there if I do that uh, that is the way probably we can visualize it that means, suppose uh, you have uh, a molecule of this kind this is atom 1 atom 2 the two are linked by a, a spring kind of a thing which is not rigid rod it is elastic it can allow the vibration to take place. And secondly what you are seeing is the molecule is rotating if it is rotating and if the j happens to be large I am expect the molecule to be undergoing some kind of a spreading out distortion from the away from the center ok that is called as a centrifugal distortion. If that be so if I consider it and this I can even demonstrate in terms of an experimental uh, data here uh, the data is about the rotation spectrum of uh, the analysis of rotation spectrum of hydrogen fluoride. What you find is that these are the experimentally observed positions of the signals which we get from uh, for different j values say j is equal to 0, the 0 1 transition is coming at 41.08 and so on and so forth. When I analyze that and try to find out the separation between these two because that is going to give me the value of 2 b prime or 2 b bar from there I can get the value of b bar and from there I can get the value of r. So, what you find is that if I try to compute the value of r from the different signals I am getting in the spectrum we find that the value of r goes on increasing gradually. So, from 1.09 sorry 0 0.0929 it goes up to 0 0.0969 that means there is a spreading out there is a extension there is a stretching of the bond that means there is a distortion coming into play. So, let us see what is the consequence of this bond elasticity and consequently the increase in the bond length. So, if I go all over again through quantum mechanics and try to treat uh, the diatomic molecule as a non rigid rotor then what I find is that the energy expression which I get from there gets modified and the expression what we now get is that is it is b bar j into j plus 1 what we had in case of rigid rotor and there is a correction term coming over here that means, this is uh, a term which is coming as a consequence of the molecule being not rigid and our the quantum number j still remains the same it is it has a value of 0 1 2 and so on and so forth and this d happens to have the following expression which is h 4 32 pi 4 t square r square k where k is the Boltzmann constant and uh, i is our moment of inertia and so on and so forth. So, this expression gets modified uh, then we can rewrite the expression as follows what you find is this d here uh, what you showed in the previous slide is called as centrifugal distortion constant and it happens to be much smaller than the rotational constant because this b bar was y rotational constant this has a large value. So, we have just seen it is 1.9 in one case or about 2 or little more than that whereas, d happens to be much much smaller. So, as a consequence what happens is uh, if I try to see that this is my energy expression if I try to work out my expression for the spectral lines the position that is the delta E value if I do that I find that the, the position at which the lines are expected will be the energy of the j plus first level uh, j plus 1 level minus that of energy of the jth level if I substitute I get an expression which is similar to what we had before we had 2 b bar j plus 1 earlier now it gets modified in terms of a small correction term here again the centrifugal distortion constant comes there and it is j plus 1 cube this is a, a, a small term, but when you j becomes large this becomes significant let us have a look at the, the spectrum uh, rather the uh, energy level diagram here. So, that is the kind of diagram we had. So, j is equal to 0 1 2 and so on and so forth level over there and as uh, we try to see here for a non rigid rotor uh, initial few levels here say 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 they will not be uh, much different from what we had in case of a rigid rotor because what we see is uh, that this term here uh, when j is small this term is not very because d is very very small when j is small this term is not significant enough and what we get is uh, this is the predominant term and the energy of different levels for different values of j does not change much, but as j becomes large say 10, 11, 12 
So, then this term becomes very significant despite the fact that our d happens to be small this term here j plus 1 cube part of it that makes it very different. So, as a consequence what we see is that for the larger values of j the energy levels get closer and closer whereas, for the smaller values of j they are similar to what we had in case of the uh, rigid rotor. So, that is a kind of change we are expecting in, in terms of the energy level diagram. Let us see that this change in the energy level diagram how does it manifest in terms of the change in the spectrum. Let us look at uh, two spectra one for the rigid rotor we remember that they are equispaced line over there. As compared to that when I look at the spectrum of non rigid rotor we find that the first few lines remain at the same position as they were earlier for a rigid rotor. But when the j value becomes larger you find that, that these lines the spectral lines start getting closer and closer. So, that is the consequence of the non rigidity. So, what basically as I mentioned earlier in this region when j becomes large our distortion coefficient uh, that distortion uh, centrifugal distortion constant term that is a correction term in our energy expression becomes significant. You remember it is minus d j plus 1 cube. So, when j becomes large this cube becomes very large and even if the d is small this uh, term becomes significant. That is as a consequence of the non rigidity we find that the lines for j higher j values get closer and closer. So, that, that is the effect of our non rigidity. Now, let us quickly sum up what we have done. What we have done today is uh, we have reviewed the previous session uh, wherein we talked about that a diatomic molecule to be a rigid rotor. Thereafter uh, we discussed the factors responsible for the intensity of spectral lines in rotation spectrum. We will recall that uh, uh, in the first episode we did not talk about anything about the intensity now we talked about the intensity. Thereafter we explained the effect of isotopic substitution on the rotation energy levels and the consequently the spectrum uh, coming from there. Then we saw that how can isotopic substitution be used in the determination of isotopic masses. And then we argued for the non rigidity of the molecule because in we, we talked about that the molecule is vibrating and also for j values larger the molecule is likely to get distorted. And as a, and thereafter we explained the consequences of elasticity of the bond in terms of the changes in the energy expression and thereafter in terms of the energy level diagram and consequently the resulting spectrum from there. So, that is all what you have done uh, today. Uh, in the next session we will talk about vibrational spectroscopy. Mm -hmm.